It's the largest island in the Mediterranean Sea, a marker point between East and West, an island upon which trade, travel routes and civilizations have converged throughout history. Benvenuti in Sicilia, welcome to Sicily and welcome to Palermo, a city at the heart of the Mediterranean, a location which for centuries has made this a crossroads between cultures and continues to do so today. In this episode, we'll be looking at how, in a city where cooking is an art form, past influences and modern challenges have had an effect on the local cuisine. This is street food, and this is Palermo. Sicily's capital is the best place to study and sample the local cuisine. Needless to say, Sicilians are proud of their food, and a quick browse around markets and bookshops gives a taste of just how varied Sicilian cuisine is. But enough about the theory. I'm here to do some culinary research of my own. First stop, a Canto Blu, one of Palermo's best-loved restaurants. Well, they say that when you're in Sicily, you should forget all about your diet, which is what I'm going to do. And there's a very famous chef here called Beppe Fontana. His best dish is baby goat, so I'm told. So that's what I'm going to go for. It's really nice, and it tastes great. Buonasera. Buonasera. Lo chef. Piacere. È andato tutto bene? Tutto perfetto, tutto buonissimo. So, grazie mille. This is Beppe Fontana. He's the chef. He cooked everything. I told him my mom is Sicilian, but I can't cook a thing, so he offered to teach me. Not sure how effective it's going to be, but we're going to try anyway. Grazie mille. <laughs> Being in Palermo is not just a feast for the taste buds, but for the eyes too. A walk around the traditional centre of the city, known as the Quattro Canti, is punctuated by the Baroque sculptures, which look on the hectic traffic. For those who prefer the art of fashion, there's the many boutiques of Via Roma. And everywhere, food stalls like this one, and street food Sicilian style. An arancino, or little orange, a fried rice ball with peas and mincemeat. Sicily is one of the southernmost points of Europe, and the different conquerors and cultures which reigned here have all left a mark, not least on the food. I think every culture, every people that have, has come here and has conquered Sicily has left its imprint not only on the, art and the architecture but also on the cooking. So, so we start with the Greeks and we go right through to also the French and maybe to the Americans with McDonald's today. <laughs> you don't have to go far here to see signs of Palermo's history. The city's cathedral is a symbol of Sicily's Catholic beliefs but the Islamic arches hint at the building's past as the city's main mosque. Back in 827 AD, the Arabs sailed across the Mediterranean from the shores of present-day Tunisia and landed in Sicily. After four years, they'd conquered Palermo. When the Arabs arrived, Palermo was abandoned because previously there were many invasions and conflicts. The Arabs came with their architecture. They turned the city into a capital. If the city's architecture bears traces of its Arab legacy, the cuisine does so even more. Ingredients which are the cornerstone of Sicilian cooking, like oranges, lemons and aubergines, were introduced to the island by its Arab conquerors. Oh, there's definitely an Arab influence. Sicilians on the whole, I think, are very proud of their Arab heritage and uh, they feel that um, that's what sets them off, makes them different from the rest of Italy. The Arabs also brought with them a food crop which was to prove revolutionary to the taste buds of the islanders and to Europe beyond. There was no sugarcane cultivated in Europe until the Arab invasion of Sicily. Any pastries, any sweets that were made before then were sweetened with honey. So once you had cane sugar, you could make Jordan almonds, you could make uh, kinds of jams and jellies that you couldn't make before. 
And they did. One of the most popular desserts here is the cassata, a sponge cake filled with ricotta cheese and topped with candied fruits. The name itself, cassata, is of Arab origin, meaning cream. <laughs> but what of that most Italian of all desserts, gelato or ice cream? Fragole <laughs> limone. That's a difficult question. Uh, I myself have written many years ago that it is an Arab gift to Sicily. That's not really true. The technology to make gelato comes from China via India and is brought in by here to Europe by the Arabs in, uh, as, a, as a scientific procedure. The idea that you have to put salt with ice to make the temperatures go down so far that you can freeze another liquid. The jury may be out on gelato's past, but here is a man who ensures its future. More than a thousand years after his conquering ancestors, Salah Ammar sailed from Egypt to Sicily in 1983, like many immigrants, in search of a better life. And he found it when a local man passed on to him a secret recipe for making Sicilian ice cream. They are secret recipes because there are small things that can completely alter the taste of gelato. For example, when making strawberry gelato, I might add a little of orange juice. Another example is the pistachio gelato, which I add a little salt to, in order to give it the right taste. In 1072, the Normans defeated the Arabs and took over Palermo, ending more than 250 years of Arab domination. Enzo Guarassi is a lecturer at Palermo University. He gave me a tour of the Norman palace from where the new conquerors ruled Sicily. You can still see the mosaics made by Arab artists commissioned by the Norman kings. The Normans were just a few soldiers, while the Arab culture had left a very strong presence. So the Normans had the great foresight not to destroy what had been built in the past, but to build on that base a culture that relaunched the idea of Mediterranean culture. It's from these ancient times that one of Palermo's most recognizable street foods originates. Panino con milza, or more simply, a spleen sandwich. This is a spleen. Not for the faint-hearted and definitely not kind on the waistline, it's made with sliced cow spleen fried in animal fat. It was originally created by the city's Jewish community and it remains popular today. In fact, it's the dish of the day every day at the Antica Focacceria di San Francesco, one of Palermo's oldest restaurants, run by the fifth generation of the Conticello family. For you, Barbara, that's your lunch today. It's my lunch today. After all this eating, it's time for a cookery lesson. True to his word, local chef Beppe Fontana takes me to Ballarò, the oldest and biggest street market in Palermo, to buy the ingredients for our lesson. Che tipo di gente viene a questo mercato? Sono gente ricca, povera? Tutto, 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 tutto. Tra i ricchi e i poveri non, non c'è differenza. Perché la, 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 come tu hai già notato, la, hanno grande possibilità di scelta, per cui conviene a tutti, anche come prezzi rispetto ai supermercati. Buying meat in Palermo is a hands-on business and the only way to ensure it's fresh is to taste it, raw, including often. No, no. Ma allora Beppe, tu spiegami queste cose perché vengono usate? Perché questi sono gli scarti. Sì, che prima praticamente non venivano usati ma servivano soltanto per far mangiare il, le, le, la povera gente. Invece Devi ora tenere. anche la gente ricca mangia no, così. Assolutamente sì, è diventato anzi un, una, delicatezza. una delicatezza. Ingredients bought, Beppe is showing me how to make a spleen sandwich, although he adds his own twist to it. It started as something the poor would eat when they were working with no time to return home. They should eat this in the middle of the street, a classic sandwich, a quick snack, so as not to waste time. Ah, ladies first. Mm. 
very good. Although Sicilians are no strangers to eating on the go, this doesn't often extend to modern-day fast food. The usual fast food outlets are to be found in Palermo, but few beyond tourists and teenagers eat there regularly. In fact, there is a national group which makes a stand against fast food outlets and promotes local food production. They're the slow food movement, and they make an art form out of mealtime. This restaurant supports them, stating clearly that anyone wanting just one course rather than three is simply not welcome. Slow food is an association, a movement, a way of life. It's not necessary to stop and go back in time. That's not possible anyway. The knowledge of cooking is in the hands of our grandparents, of older people. But within 15 to 20 years, we risk losing everything. Slow food is trying to save the way food is prepared, as well as the way it is produced. We have to fight to achieve this. I leave Francesco to his culinary struggle and embrace another quintessential Italian tradition, driving around on a Vespa. Palermo has bigger problems than the demise of traditional cooking. After the break, I'll be heading out of the capital and into the Sicilian heartland, where a very famous small town will provide a glimpse into a darker corner of Palermo's soul. This is the heartland of Sicily, away from the busy streets of the island's capital, Palermo. Throughout Roman times, Sicily was described as the grain field of Italy. The particularly fertile soil here produces what locals will proudly tell you are some of the world's best olives. Olive oil has been a part of Mediterranean life for more than 3,000 years, and it's the most essential and basic ingredient to Sicilian and Italian dishes. The Sicilian countryside is also one of Europe's oldest winemaking regions. From its wine and olives to its lemons and oranges, this rural heartland has for centuries exported its produce to Europe and beyond. But the idyllic scenery and peaceful farm life was the cradle for one of the most infamous of organizations. Sicilian food is well known around the world, but Sicily is also famous for something else, the Mafia. Behind me is the town of Corleone, which was featured in the film The Godfather, but the reality of the Mafia is far from Hollywood glamour. The secret criminal organization spreads its tentacles into all parts of society, including into the very food that people eat. The Sicilian Mafia is known as Cosa Nostra, or Our Thing, and it started in the 19th century as a racketeering organization, springing from the groves around Palermo. Farmers were compelled to pay protection money to the Mafia, which went on to become one of the most powerful and notorious criminal organizations in the world. It may have gone global, but it retains a local grip one which Antonino Iannazzo, the mayor of Corleone, knows all too well. The Mafia is an organization that tells you where to go, what to eat, how to dress, what you should buy. The Mafia can influence the strategic decisions of the Republic, who gets promoted, who gets stopped, which politicians to join the parliament. If they were business plan, it would be perfect. It's a shame, it's a criminal idea. Two magistrates, both from Palermo, became particularly famous for their anti-Mafia investigations. Giovanni Falcone, seen here on the left, and his colleague Paolo Borsellino on the right, made it their mission to indict Mafia bosses. In 1992, both men were killed in separate car bomb attacks, less than two months apart, in Palermo. The killings started a wave of public rebellion against the Mafia. This show of defiance to organized crime became apparent at Borsellino's funeral. After the deaths of the two prosecutors, the Italian government went on the offensive, confiscating lands belonging to known Mafia bosses 
and distributing them to cooperatives of local farmers. This cooperative is called Libera Terra, or Liberated Land, and the food it produces is clearly labelled as mafia-free. A bold move against the mafia, but not one without its problems. We had some retaliation on our fifth year working. We had no people uh, working here. We had two fields burnt and a tractor stolen. And uh, we also had no distributor in Sicily. The presence of the Mafia is still strong in many parts of Sicily. The Antica Focacceria di San Francesco is famous for more than its spleen sandwiches. The Conticello brothers, who run the restaurant, had their own brush with Cosa Nostra in November 2005, when a man they'd never seen before walked into their restaurant. A person came um, to um, visit us, asking to meet my brother uh, or me, because um, he had something to, to tell us. Uh, we told him that uh, it was maybe better to meet him after one hour because at that time we couldn't speak with him. And uh, this was the first part of uh, the story. The Conticello brothers called the local police and told them of their suspicions. An hour later, when the same man returned to talk to Fabio's brother, plainclothes policemen were nearby. Two people from the staff of Carabiniere, the local police, uh, was sitting exactly uh, in front the table where my uh, brother and that man uh, were speaking about something. He just said that probably it's better that uh, um, you have inside your restaurant a person who could help you. Vincenzo, my brother, understood immediately what uh, he wanted and he told him immediately, but maybe you were asking me to pay the pizza, the protection, the man was arrested and charged with attempted extortion. He's now serving a 10-year prison sentence. The brothers identified him in court, making them the symbol of how individuals can stand up to the mafia. But that's something which has cost them some clients. Many clients was visiting our restaurant in uh, quite uh, in, in, in a regular way, so we, we, we could see uh, them uh, one or two times uh, for each month, for example. And we noted that in the uh, next six months, uh, no visit from, from them. For every client who's been too scared to frequent the restaurant, there has been a new one who comes to show his or her support. But they eat under the scrutiny of more than 20 surveillance cameras and 24-hour police protection, testament to the continued mafia threat. If you ask me if I'm afraid now about uh, uh, this situation, in, in one part of uh, uh, my idea I can say uh, no, I'm not afraid because I know I'm not alone, I know uh, police is with me and people is with me. In the other part, uh, of course, uh, as a, a man, as a, um, a businessman, I, I can say of course, I know that we opened something of, uh, of new and probably mm, some people from Mafia could remember tomorrow what we did and then uh, it could be a problem, but we don't want to think about this situation. The Conticello brothers have become inspirations for others who want to say no to the Mafia. More and more of these signs have been popping up in shop windows all over Palermo. Addio Pizzo means goodbye protection money, and it shows that these shops publicly refuse to pay the Mafia. Organized crime is not the only challenge that Palermo is facing. The relentless pace of development has meant that Palermo is growing, but not in the way that some would like to see. Giovanni Franzitta is an architect who's concerned about the risk of losing Palermo's cultural heritage to modern urban development. He says Palermo's open markets are a case in point. The area of Vucceria market is important. If you look at the buildings, you will find them empty. They have been bought and the people who bought them are waiting for something. 
waiting until they replace the market with residential buildings. So there is no will to develop the market. In fact, for them, the earlier it dies, the better it is. The architecture may be changing, but one tradition still going strong in Sicily is the daily ritual of a sit-down family meal. Barbara Serra di Al Jazeera. I was invited to Sunday lunch by the Provenzano family who own and run a local laundrette. Buongiorno, piacere, no, Barbara. I had high hopes of a great meal until I found out I had to cook too. Sort of dark inside, then it's finished. And? Ma lo sai che sei brava. Ah, oh, grazie. She says I'm good, but she's just being nice. <laughs> Three generations of the Provenzano family sit down for a meal together every day. Today, it's aubergine and pasta with some animated conversation on the side. Palermo may be beautiful, but life here is sometimes difficult. Sicily has one of the highest unemployment rates in Europe. This leads many to emigrate to mainland Italy or abroad. But while some Sicilians leave to find work, foreigners from developing countries make the perilous journey from the south of the Mediterranean for their own chance of a better life. Not all find the success they'd hoped for, but 30 years ago, it was possible to make a new life from scratch. Abdul Hamid is a Tunisian who arrived penniless in Palermo in the 1970s. Today, he owns three restaurants in the city. The menu we serve is a mixture of Italian and Tunisian food. We serve Italian pizza and we serve Tunisian dishes such as couscous or other Tunisian appetizers. It was a new thing that we introduced and people liked and enjoyed it. Abdul Hamid's restaurant is situated here in Piazza Olivella, the center of Palermo's nightlife and the melting pot of eateries and people. On the city streets, it's clear to see how past dominations have created a mix of peoples which has enriched the local culture and cuisine. Palermo continues to be a gateway between east and west, north and south, and as influences continue to pour in, Palermo looks set to stay true to its past and make a virtue of diversity. Thank you.